Hello, everyone, and welcome to MEI Climate Week 2023. Uh, my name is Mohammed Mahmoud. I'm the director of the Middle East Institute's Climate and Water Program. And very happy uh, to have you join us this week. Um, we have a lot of activities planned that I'll, I'll, I'll get into in a second. But I just want to take a moment to reflect on where we are today, as opposed to when we held this event about a year ago, uh, Climate Week 2022. A lot has changed in the region, uh, and a lot has happened uh, with regards to climate issues and uh, developments. Obviously, from a physical perspective, we've all seen, uh, since we've had this event last year, uh, right at the beginning of summer, uh, a, lot of, a lot of the impacts in the region tend to manifest during the summertime. Uh, the advent of all these uh, intense dust storm events that transpired over the Arabian Peninsula dominated uh, headlines uh, in the beginning of the summer, uh, April through uh, April through June of last year. And then we shifted into a really intense heat wave, not just across the Middle East region, but really uh, across several continents uh, from Europe, uh, Africa, uh, uh, and Asia as well. And then we shifted as we moved into you know, post-summer and, and oceans were warmer, uh, the monsoon season, and we all uh, obviously saw the news and all the, the intense flooding. The rainstorm events that happened across the Middle East region are mainly a lot around the Arabian Peninsula, but also the intense flooding events that transpired over Pakistan and Afghanistan. So we've seen a lot of these impacts really amplify since the last year. And then on top of that, the overlay of, of, of the policy issues related to that, because of the drought conditions that have also persisted across the region. Transboundary issues uh, uh, in the region amongst certain countries have also uh, amplified. And we think of transboundary issues that have happened over the Nile uh, and the Tigris Euphrates with less water being generated at the headwaters of those rivers and how that's affected the available water supply and the relationships between uh, countries. So a lot of challenges have developed over the last year. But we've also seen some positive progress in a number of areas, certainly on the policy front. We ended uh, last year, uh, close to ending last year on COP27 uh, in Egypt and Sharm el-Sheikh, and that yielded uh, what, what a lot of people uh, noted as a, as a huge advancement uh, with uh, the deal on loss and damage and the resolution to move forward on that as a way to address the um, uh, the inequalities of the past when it came to developing countries and vulnerable countries dealing with climate change and hopefully opening the door to addressing some of the other short gaps uh, in terms of climate financing uh, as it relates to climate mitigation as well as adaptation and things like the uh, adaptation fund. A couple of other global efforts uh, uh, took place, High Seas Treaty and the 30 by 30 deal. Uh, 30 by 30 deal uh, uh, developing from the biodiversity COP that took place, I believe, in Montreal, uh, looking at preserving 30% of the world's land and water resources by 2030. And the High Seas Treaty, more of a broader deal uh, to protect um, larger water bodies or, or water bodies at large uh, uh, from, um, from adverse impact. And then we've also seen, and I mean, a lot of good things have happened. And, and just to cap off on that, we've also seen more information, more progress on UAE MUSTA's uh, uh, facilitation of the water uh, for power deal uh, between Jordan and Israel. So there's there's been some positive movements as well, despite the challenges. And all of these have not necessarily just happened on the large scale. Uh, we, we can't ignore things that have happened on the smaller scale. Uh, groups in the region continue to stay engaged uh, to push climate agenda onward. Certainly, we think of youth activism in the region. A lot of organizations have popped up, and we're going to delve into some of that uh, in, in our panel, uh, one of our panels later this week. And other organizations have addressed the climate crisis in different ways. Uh, efforts to plant mangroves as a way to protect against sea level rise uh, and, and the coastal areas of the region. Efforts at reducing waste looking at water efficient farming, uh, the shift to hydroponic farming in some countries in the region as a way to mitigate against large water footprints, um, and a number of other efforts uh, that look at managing detrimental environmental outcomes in sustainable ways. And we're going to talk about all of that uh, in our different panels throughout the week. So there's some reason to be hopeful um, for the region to achieve some level of uh, improved climate resilience despite the challenges and warnings that have been posed from a near future 
uh, that that we're expecting now to see uh, warming sooner uh, and higher behind beyond thresholds that are uh, intended to manage climate change. You know, we talk about the 1.5 to 2 degree uh, threshold uh, Celsius of, of of warming. That's sort of our, our our mark to to fight against. But even with hope, there's still much work ahead. Um, with COP27 and the Bonn Conference quite recently behind us, we now look towards COP28 in the UAE later this year to address some of these larger <clears throat> policy type issues. And besides anticipating issues of importance and, and desired outcomes out of COP28, in this event, our Climate Week this year, we'll also discuss climate related topics that really have great significance to the region uh, in terms of challenges and solutions. This year's Climate Week, in, in, in response to that, is exploring the natural nexus of prevalent areas of concern uh, and how these intersections of key topics look like for the Middle East and North Africa. So using that idea, besides just looking at the usual or predominant topics and issues, we're looking at a combination of topics, some that naturally align with each other and others that are maybe a little bit distant, but should be connected to each other. So for example, uh, we're looking at topics that are connected in ways such as water management and environmental sustainability, which is our theme for today. Tomorrow, we're going to look at youth activism and climate engagement. On Wednesday, we're looking now at the climate and security nexus. And then on Thursday, the energy transition and the green circular economy, so the combination of energy and economics. And then finally, on Friday, we'll close on uh, the theme focusing on cities, both in terms of climate resilience and sustainability. So it's a full week of excellent panel discussions moderated by several of MEI's directors, scholars, advisory council members, and we feature a, a plethora of speakers from across the range of academia, research institutions, utilities, uh, public ministries, public organizations, and, and more. And we're also pleased uh, for this year's keynote uh, that will take place on Thursday. Uh, we're going to have some remarks by Her Excellency Dr. Nawal al Hosseini, uh, who's the United Arab Emirates Permanent Representative in IRENA, which is the International Renewable Energy uh, uh, Agency. And that keynote, as I said, will take place on Thursday, preceding that day's panel on energy transition and the green circular economy. So I'm very excited for the agenda that we have this year, and I'm very glad that you all will join us either live or watching this later uh, uh, post uh, post release and all the wonderful speakers we have lined up this year. And I hope you'll find it uh, both informative and useful as we look ahead to addressing and, and, and hopefully look towards finding solutions uh, to resolve some of the climate associated uh, uh, changes uh, and developments that the MENA region uh, will face. So with, these op with that concluded in terms of my opening remarks, I will uh, transition to kick us off on our first panel uh, for the week today, which is like I said, is gonna be on water management uh, and environmental sustainability. And to do that, I'd like to introduce uh, the panel moderator uh, for, for that, who is uh, a dear friend of mine, Mr. Paul Fleming. And just a little bit more about Paul Fleming before he transitions to the panel and, and the panelists uh, for today. Uh, so Paul is uh, uh, one of uh, uh, MEI's Climate and Water Program Advisory Council members. Uh, he is the founder and president of Water Value LLC, which is an advisory and consulting firm. Uh, that really uh, operates in the intersection of water, climate change, technology, and corporate strategy. Uh, he also, um, beyond that, is active in terms of, uh, call it a service, uh, with the Alliance for Global Water Adaptation uh, and the U.S. National Academies of Services Committee. So he serves uh, um, uh, advisory type roles uh, there as well. Um, this previous work has included uh, leading the Global Water Program for Microsoft's uh, Corporate Environmental Sustainability Group. Um, and he has also uh, uh, been working with Seattle Public Utilities and was a former uh, chair and lead for the Water Utility Climate Alliance, which is uh, how, we, uh, how we first knew each other, uh, but have done many other things since. So Paul, uh, with that, very, very excited for you to lead the discussion. and, and uh, 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 topic and uh, talk with uh, the panelists we have lined today. Terrific. Thank you so much, Mohammed. Um, it sounds like a great week uh, ahead of us uh, with, with what the uh, Institute has pulled together and a terrific way to close out the first half of the year and look forward to the second half. 
So we have four great, excellent panelists today. Um, I'm my intent here is to try and stimulate a discussion uh, across the panel uh, and with the audience and the, and the attendees. I have some some questions laid out, but I also encourage those of you who are um, joining this session to post your questions in the Q and A, and I'll do my best to bring those forward and bring them to the, the panel to, to to respond to. I would also encourage the panel if you see a question come through the Q and A that just gets you fired up, um, feel free to jump on it and respond, um, knowing that if if you're doing a multitasking activity and I ask you a question, I may catch you uh, in the middle of multitasking, but that's okay. I think we're amongst friends and we won't um, we won't judge anyone for that. So the the intent here is a, would love to start off by. Um, having the panel really elaborate on the excellent context setting that Muhammad provided here with his opening remarks. And um, then the intent is to then talk a little bit about this, this process of how to uh, generate knowledge and translate it into practice. Um, and I think all of our panelists are uh, particularly adept at that and have uh, experience in real world application of their leading edge knowledge generation. And then um, towards the end, look ahead to uh, both COP28 and also more generally, you know, what are what are sort of areas of hope for you? Where do you see success stories or the beginnings of the ingredients of success around water management, environmental sustainability in the Middle East? Uh, and throughout that, again, try and weave in some questions from the audience as well as observations. Um, I would encourage the panel if you have uh, questions you want to ask your fellow panelists, let's let's do that as well. So with that in mind, and, and I'll say I think we're going to aim for about an hour, <clears throat> maybe an hour and 15 minutes, so would intend to wrap probably about uh, 1130 or so uh, Eastern Standard Time. So with that in mind, again, uh, elaborating on Mohammed's observations, Dana, I'm going to turn to you first to see if you could share your thoughts in terms of what are the, from your perspective, what are the biggest areas of concern? You know, what's the proverbial keep you up at night issue? And you can think about that in any way you want. Uh, you can think about it from a pan Middle East perspective or thematically, if there's a sp specific topic that has uh, great concern for you in a specific subregion, feel free to go that route as well. And if you can keep this to about three minutes, then we'll go through the panel and pivot to the next topic. Deanna. Hello, hello everyone. Um, thank you for uh, for this panel. Thank you, Paul, for the introduction and Mohammed as well. And thank you for the Middle East Institute for uh, putting together this interesting uh, week on the climate. It's really a hot topic uh, in uh, recent years, especially this year uh, with the climate crisis with several um, disasters related to uh, climate change happening around the world. Uh, so I'm Dr. Diana Francis, I'm a climate scientist and I'm professor at Khalifa University in the United Arab Emirates in Abu Dhabi, the capital. And I uh, am the head also of the Environmental and Geophysical Sciences Lab at Khalifa University. Um, I've been working on uh, atmospheric science and climate science for more than 15 years now, uh, started in Europe and uh, moved to the UE in 2016. And I've navigated through uh, the climate science for the different uh, climatic regions that we can find on our planet from both polar to tropics to subtropics and mid-latitudes. Um, and uh, the specificity of the uh, Middle East uh, region is really that uh, uh, it's a region that is uh, influenced by uh, several climatic regions. And this is what makes it uh, very difficult to first understand uh, its climate and uh, being able to uh, predict it accurately. Uh, this is uh, one of the core of our work here at NGOs at KU, uh, where we look into um, the, the climate in, in the Middle East area and the MENA region in general, in order to uh, know better uh, how it is changing uh, and in which way it will be changing in recent years, because knowledge is essential. If we know, we can adapt, we can change, uh, uh, we can 
prevent as well. Um, now, regarding the um, uh, the water water uh, issue in the in the in the region, as you know, the region is predominantly arid, semi-arid, uh, meaning that uh, the availability of fresh water is uh, is uh, scarce. So we do have this natural problem already. Uh, additional stress is uh, being put on this um, issue by climate change, of course, uh, with uh, droughts that are. Uh, happening in, uh, in different regions. Uh, in the opposite, we have uh, flooding happening again in other areas. So these extremes uh, are of course uh, projected to increase uh, in both ways, meaning the, the extreme in drought and extreme in uh, flooding. Uh, in addition to um, uh, the, the climate change stress on, on the water uh, resources of the region, we do have um, other factors that are uh, worth taking into account when uh, taking a holistic uh, approach to, um, to the water issue in the Middle East is uh, actually the, the growing population uh, and the urbanization of the, of the region. Uh, the, the, these ha have been happening at the um, uh, very high rate um, without allowing for the natural resources to follow. And of course, we should mention uh, as well uh, the conflicts, the transboundary uh, water conflicts uh, that exist among the region because um, uh, there is no um, unified uh, management system for, for the water resources across the different countries. Uh, so with that, um, I'll hand it over to you uh, to hear from the other panelists, and I'll uh, uh, jump in later in the discussion. Great, thank you. And I think this, um, for those of us who work in water, I think the connection between climate and water is is readily apparent, but not always the case. I think carbon has tended to be the the, the driver, viewed as the driver of climate change, and legitimately is um I often say if that carbon is the driver, water is the casualty in some ways. And I think you've nicely uh, started to frame that up. Nusha, can I, can I turn to you and um, see if you can also elaborate on what you see as some of the, the key challenges at, at this point in time with respect to water and environmental sustainability in the Middle East? Sure. Hi, everyone. I'm Nusha Ajami, the Chief Development Officer for Research at Lawrence Berkeley National Lab. Um, really pleasure to be here. Um, I've worked on water for uh, many years and uh, uh, water and climate change and water and energy has been sort of the cores of my um, the research areas. Um, I think Diana beautifully put it, I think a couple of things that are important, especially when we talk about Middle East is the geographical, cultural, and climatic diversity that we, we see across the board. There are different countries with different kind of uh, water resource availability, governance structure, cultural needs, and um, practices, and um, and also the way their infrastructure is designed and built. You know, you have countries with uh, you know, old infrastructure, some with newer infrastructure, and a lot of that actually plays a very key role when you're talking about water, um, how they uh, manage or deal with climate change, how, what are their opportunities for adaptation, and what kind of governance structure do they have? So that that also very much is foundational to the way these, the water is managed. For sure, um, uh, Many have heard that um, the, one of the biggest concerns is the MENA region is um, expected uh, to be one of the among the first in the world to be um, running out of water potentially if we are considering the, on the path we are in and uh, water resources are being sort of uh, depleted faster than they're being replenished. So you have regions that their groundwater levels have dropped significantly. You see a lot of um, sinking land um, uh, on in countries that depend on snowpack. The snowpack is disappearing. Um, some of the, um, and, and that is a problem. Obviously, uh, precipitation patterns have been changing significantly as the uh, same. Um, and uh, uh, having uh, flooding and droughts and temperatures uh, rising, that's another huge important element that sort of increases the amount of water to be, that, that uh, the region needs to survive. Um, so that's also a very important issue. And as Paul mentioned, 
And um, obviously, everybody is very much focused on stopping this fast moving off track train of climate change. But um, the limited focus is going to, OK, you know, we might be might be um, needing to focus on that sort of stopping that train. But we also need to focus on how to adapt to the impacts that is happening as it's moving down. And uh, the adaptation has been definitely uh, sort of back of mind and not many, many people have been focusing on. Um, one thing I want to mention uh, before VEEPS, and I, I very much look forward to sort of expanding on all these issues and see how, you know, like uh, focusing on every one of them and see how they're sort of interlinked um, with every the challenges we are facing in the region. But one thing that's very important to remember is um, the opportunity areas are, again, different depending on where we are looking at. But unfortunately, uh, and actually fortunately, in some areas, we have a chance to reimagine how we do water resource management. There is an opportunity to think about what kind of infrastructure do we need? Do we really, really need to build the same way we built in the 20th century? And um, or, But what, it, what we see is, unfortunately, some of the old ways of doing water resource management and traditional infrastructure is being sort of um, expanded in the region as in a hope that it would help us to um, achieve water security, which actually in some regions you see in Northern, Af Northern Africa, some of the efforts that have been around like damming rivers have been actually causing more problem rather than helping um, uh, and achieving the objectives that were intended, or actually you can see in Iran, because of some of the water management issues, you have lakes that are drying up because um, the, you know, the, the thoughts that had to go into how to, um, how to maintain the ecosystem health as you're achieving water security um, needs to be considered. So some of these things, we have the knowledge right now. We know what their impacts are, but we are not necessarily implementing them. So I think um, it's the relationship between climate change is impacting the water availability, temperatures, and the timing that we receive water and clashing with our old, uh, outdated governance structure that we are sort of persisting throughout the region and we are sort of insisting to keep expanding it, the top-down monstrous system that we depend on and the infrastructure model that is very common across the board. Um, and I think unless we sort of rethink this relationship, it's this is going to be um, a causing more challenges in the years to come as we are dealing with the impacts of climate change. Thank you, Nusha. That's terrific. And I think, you know, you often hear this phrase, the past is no longer prologue with respect to climate change. And uh, that really butts up against this notion of, of continuing to do what we've always done uh, as a, uh, the, the, um, the challenges of, of trying to extend and, as you said, uh, persist with these methods that may no longer work and maybe haven't even don't work now, right? Let alone into a changing future. So, and I'd love to come back to this issue of how to uh, how to um, disseminate knowledge and and help to facilitate the uh, resiliency and adaptation that needs to happen. Um, and I think all of you are really well positioned to have that discussion. Logan, I wanted to now turn to you and see if you could also, from your perspective. Um, share what you see as some of the key challenges uh, in the Middle East, again, thinking thematically or across the region or sub-geographic areas, but please share with us what you what you see and what's top of mind for you. Thank you, and thanks for having me. Um, Logan Cochran, based here at Hamad bin Khalifa University in Qatar, and, and I get the benefit of following two excellent speakers who've covered a lot of the issues, so I won't uh, repeat or try not to repeat too much as What's been said in the climate and environment space, maybe um, two things that I'll add. One uh, is sea level rise in the longer term as a, as a longer term risk. The region uh, has, as mentioned, a growing population, but also a growing population that's uh, largely coastal and um, without long term visions and the right infrastructure to manage this creates a, a serious risk. 
And um, I think a lot of the, the countries in the region could do uh, more thinking and more preparation for on, on this front. And then the second, which has been a bit mentioned before, is these extreme weather events, both um, in areas becoming uh, more arid from semi-arid to arid, um, as well as extreme events on the other end where we have uh, flooding. And I go back to this infrastructural point that, um, and, and this is more of a nearer term of risk that requires more immediate action, but we could see uh, you know, significant challenges emerge uh, if uh, flooding is, is not managed. And similarly, if uh, droughts are, are not managed more proactively. So I think this, this ties into conversations we'll have uh, later, but another broader issue, which before we can get to strategy, before we can get to implementation, before we can get to infrastructure and efficiency management, for much of the region, we need to, to look at, at peace and security. And uh, I think some of my, my points later will, will point to the importance of, of the broader environment that uh, countries are facing in terms of insecurity and conflict that are serious barriers for making progress in the in the environment and water sustainability space. Excellent. I'm sitting here thinking, I wonder if we could extend this to a day-long discussion. Um, you start talking about infrastructure uh, as a former utility person, I get definitely get interested in that. Um, so, and again, I encourage the audience to pose questions to the Q&A as, as we go through this session. Hussein, um, you, you're a professor of water politics and policy, so um, you have a rich uh, background and perspective. Can you share your thoughts on some what you see as some of the key challenges uh, before the before us in the Middle East with respect to water and sustainability? Uh, thank you, Paul. Uh, I'm a faculty at Colorado School of Mines. I've been studying water issues in the Middle East for a long time. Most recently, my focus has shifted to the um, Arab Persian Gulf, and I've been working on water food security uh, with a particular focus on politics and policy and management of water. The key challenges, uh, key water challenges in the Middle East um, that I can think of and in no particular order um, are uh, the lack of interstate cooperation uh, when it comes to water management of international rivers. Um, uh, something that um, keeps me up at night is the fact that the, the reaction to the Ukraine war um, when it comes to the uh, move across the world and certainly in the Middle East away from globalization to more localization. And I'm thinking, of course, here in particular about the localization of food production when it comes to this uh, panel discussion. Um, that is a, um, a concern that we need to be paying attention to, I think. The, um, the relationship, another issue is the relationship between water scarcity and state security. Logan um, alluded to it a bit and, uh, and, and others alluded to it. And uh, I'm thinking about, of course, recent events in, um, in Iran, in, um, uh, in Syria, in um, the western parts of Darf uh, Sudan, Darfur, and other places. Um, water mismanagement uh, slash corruption and state fragility. Uh, how state fragility affects uh, water management in the long term, and of course, um, they have these have social as well as security implications. Something that hasn't been getting uh, as much attention as I think it needs to is the relationship between um, land, water, and climate um, is the salinization of water and soil. Uh, and of course, when I say soil, I'm thinking about agriculture and agricultural production and food security. And we, um, there's also a, a growing and rapid salinization of the Arab or Persian Gulf uh, over time, and that would impact um, uh, desalination uh, plants in the region. Water waste, water loss, 
as well as food waste and food loss. Um, an issue that, a uh, separate issue that is dear to my heart um, is the, in my mind, that there is a social, psychosocial attitudes in the Middle East, whereby in many, many countries, there's an imagined infinity of water supply. And of course, that is a misnomer that needs, in my mind, to change. Um, uh, another question is, how do we transition? How do economies in the Middle East transition from water intensive economic growth to water efficient economic growth? Um, uh, my good colleague, uh, Logan alluded to climate change and infrastructure, and I um, uh, would like to underscore that. And I will, the, the way I would phrase it uh, from my vantage point is uh, climate change and sea level rising would impact coastal infrastructures like desalination plants. Uh, and um, I don't believe that we have sufficient understanding of the nature of these impacts. Uh, there are, of course, plenty of opportunities to reimagine water management, as uh, my colleague uh, Nusha Hajami uh, alluded to. The um, question before us is how do we execute on the sustainability agenda? How do we carry out the sustainability agenda? And that's a big topic that would require a day long conversation. As Paul said earlier, go ahead, Paul. It's back to you. Excellent, great. Well, this is uh, this is terrific, and I, that phrase "imagined infinity" is um, captured my my attention. Uh, such an apt a depiction of the challenging mindset that we're we're dealing with here. Um, so, I there's a lot of paths to go down here based on your guys' opening uh, comments, and I. Um, I, th I thought of sort of two that I would like to couch within this notion of how to um, transition uh, and generate knowledge that gets put into practice. Because you have all have shared thoughts from your experience on um, essentially kind of what needs to be addressed, what what needs to happen, and um, really curious to hear your thoughts on how that can be 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 put to work. So. Let's take the infrastructure one. And I think um, Deanna and Nusha I would love for you to think about how in your work um, you're able or have you seen successful examples of where uh, your research can be put into practice to help inform uh, infrastructure management and the evolution that needs to happen around infrastructure management. Again, when I worked for a utility, one of the reasons we wanted to engage with the climate research community was to understand, you know, what are some plausible futures uh, around climate change and how do we then adapt our systems? How do we design our systems differently to prepare for those futures? Um, but it really puts some challenges in terms of how engineers work um, and moving from sort of a singular point and planning for that to, how do you build adaptive infrastructure that can change and pivot over time to accommodate different scenarios? So we'd love to hear a little bit about that. And then um, Logan, you you mentioned this issue of how security is uh, is sort of a precursor in your view to, to working on some of these issues we brought up. There was a, someone in uh, Lindsay from <clears throat> one of the attendees said she respect, respectfully wanted to push back a little bit on that. I'm wondering if there's a way to sort of tackle peace and security in parallel with climate work. And so I'm wondering if um, you and Hussein can uh, elaborate on this issue of how to get knowledge uh, generation, the, the, the new needs that we have put into place as it, as it has to do with security. So first, Deanna, we'll turn to you. Um, on this infrastructure issue, and do you see many of your clients uh, asking for and looking for a little bit more clarity around sort of plausible futures with respect to climate change? And 
incorporating that into their infrastructure decisions, or is that still um, something that isn't quite happening in the Middle East um, from your perspective? Yeah, thank you, Paul, for the interesting question. I think uh, we need to uh, look into this question uh, with different uh, uh, facets because in uh, different areas of the Middle East, the approach is different. Uh, so not all the countries can be put in the same um, you know, pool of answer. But uh, regarding at least um, the UAE and um, uh, the GCC countries, uh, we've been seeing a lot of uh, effort uh, put into um, uh, the will to integrate the climate issues in, into the infrastructure and also uh, the energy that is being produced uh, in these countries. So uh, basically when we are approached by um, uh, decision makers, uh, by uh, agencies or by uh, government entities, uh, we are asked to uh, provide you know insight on what are the challenges and these can be uh, divided into um, let's say short term mid term and then long term uh, because uh, the the answer and the response to these challenges will depend on uh, when these will uh, challenges will happen uh, and something that can work in the short term maybe cannot work uh, in the long term and um, uh, as you know, um, the, the climate climate issue, even if now, for example, we succeed to uh, reduce the emissions to the level that we want to reach, we still need to adapt to the change that is going to happen in the coming decades because of the high emissions that we produced in the uh, last uh, 40 decades because of the lifetime of the greenhouse gases. So in any case, we need to have uh, adaptation measures uh, because uh, uh, the changes will happen. So we need to adapt, we need to uh, build resilience. Um, and then uh, for the long term, yes, we need to align to the um, uh, reduction, to the mitigation efforts, so reduction in emissions, uh, but also what will still happen, for example, for the sea level rise, for the coastal cities, for, uh, for the, the protection of uh, the marine life as well uh, with the rising temperature, uh, especially in uh, in the Gulf and in the surrounding seas here in the Arabian Peninsula. Uh, in the short term, for example, the needs are uh, how the weather uh, that is induced by climate change will will uh, will be uh, happening. For example, uh, for renewable energies, for the solar parks, this is a very important issue because if they are projecting to produce certain amount of solar energy, but because of severe dust storms or or because of more cloudiness, uh, or or because of more uh, higher temperature that can the panel support, for example, uh, uh, these will not. Produce Reduce uh, the projected amount of electricity. This is a big issue uh, for uh, the countries and for the governments. So there is a lot of need actually for uh, more accurate information about the changes that are going to happen in the short term. Uh, again, for the midterm, it's more about uh, the, the changes in the patterns, uh, meaning uh, the, the patterns regionally, how are they are going to change with regards to temperature, to um, uh, sea level rise and to precipitation. These are the, ma the main three uh, variables that um, stakeholders are um, uh, looking at because of, of all the implications that this will produce to, the, to their infrastructure. For example, in the UAE, the Ministry of uh, Infrastructure and Energy is um, uh, taking seriously the, uh, the threat that is coming from the extreme temperature in summer for all, for example, the, uh, the bridges, the roads, um, even the buildings, uh, how, how these materials can support uh, these extreme temperatures that are going to increase uh, if the projections are correct by five degrees per decade. Mm. These are the latest projections. Um, yeah, this is how actually we are uh, solicited in, in terms of uh, giving insight on the climate change with these different uh, milestones. Great. Uh, Nisha, I'm going to come back to you in a moment, but first I was going to pivot to Logan Hussein, and you both brought up this issue of security, and I'm I'm curious, uh, what do you, or how do you get your research and your knowledge of, of your um, your team, your, your universities, into the hands of decision makers, and how do you, what are the steps you take to help 
facilitate the utilization of that information you know what what's this is that this issue of application and um if you can see and have a sense of what's coming and are, are not able to uh put that to work that can be really frustrating right um so what are your strategies for helping to get the work that you do disseminated into the hands of decision makers or into the hands of communities that can use that information to better prepare for an uncertain future. Um, Logan, can you start off? Sure, thank you. And thanks, Lindsay, for, for the question. And maybe I can take this opportunity to clarify. If I if I yeah. said, uh, you know, hold off on, on doing anything on water until peace and security, then I misspoke. I think hopefully what I said was that it's a key barrier. And what I had in mind here were um, conflict and instability result in massive infrastructural loss as we see in Yemen or Syria and so on. Um, and uh, and so we need peace and security to be able to have access to basic uh, water and to be able to sustain it uh, without threat of, of destruction and so forth. But of course, uh, Nexus approaches that integrate both uh, from the outset, from humanitarian context that that integrates uh, security perspectives from, from all sides, from the humanitarian realm to, realm to the development side, um is is the is the best way to go and you know where i generally have been writing about and working on um so hopefully that clarifies uh sort of what, what i was thinking about and what i meant with that comment and then in getting it uh, into the hands of decision makers in uh in the era or the age of implementation that that we're in uh i think we've really been pushed uh i think almost all of us are in, in universities uh, outside of our offices, and that's a great thing. And part of putting the research that we do into action, we've collectively realized that it requires knowledge co-production, co-ownership, and new forms of collaboration. And this requires, you know, depending on the the scale of the the challenge that we're working on, uh, all sorts of coming together. And if I just give you a quick example, we're working on uh, water systems. Uh, governance in in rural Ethiopia, and you know some of the some of the challenges are access to data about knowing who who has water, what types of water, what quality of water, et cetera. But then once we have data systems about the management uh, of these systems, unfortunately across uh, Africa or sub-Saharan Africa, there's an estimated fifty thousand water points that are non-functional. Um, so how do we ensure that, that water is accessible? Uh, again, integrating this into uh, adaptation perspectives that Nusha mentioned or thinking about the future as water tables uh, maybe dropping in some locations and so forth. Uh, so we, in this in this example that I have in mind from Ethiopia, took a, a nexus approach where we have uh, a policy and a government and sort of an applied working with NGOs, working with donor agencies, all collectively together to, to shift the way that the water management sector is working. And Without all of us shifting the way we work, uh, the, the shift is, is unlikely to take place or just have piecemeal effects. Uh, so if I give you an example, there are many donor agencies that were coming to build new uh, micro or medium scale water infrastructure. But uh, there was, and then the project ends three to five, typical donor cycle, three to five years. And then the, the maintenance, the parts, the knowledge and the capacity to keep those uh, functional are not transitioned or transformed over to uh, a permanent entity, whether it's a local water authority or a regional government or, or something like that. Um, and that's why we see a lot of water points non-functional after some period of time. So we had to shift the policy side, we had to shift to create you know, requirements that NGOs or donors working in the region need to have uh, feed into a broader database, create that database and so forth. So long story short, I think, you know, new forms of collaboration in this age of implementation that we collectively own, we collectively develop, mm -hmm. and we collectively produce um, the, the work that we do. And that helps uh, turn, you know, research into, into practice and application. Uh, and I think, you know, an exciting side is that governments are really interested, uh, at least uh, in my experience, governments have been really interested to engage in these collaborations, as have communities, NGOs. And I think people in general are increasingly uh, curious and you know, want to find more information about what they can do or what's happening in their region and, and get involved with what's happening in their region. And to give just a brief example of this, uh, last year we started a, a bilingual podcast, Arabic and English, on uh, sustainability issues in the Middle East. And uh, it's 
been number one in 12 countries and all of them uh, Arabic speaking countries. And in the beginning, people told us, uh, you know, podcasts in Arabic are not popular and uh, people are not really interested in these issues. And so it's really been a positive sign that uh, there is also this interest, broader interest to learn more, to get engaged, to change, you know, uh, how these systems are working to become a transition towards a more sustainable future. <clears throat> That's great. Um... Uh, you need to drop the where we can find the podcast in the in the chat here or somewhere so we we can make sure it stays the top podcast in those 12 countries um you know that you reminded me of something i often used to say when i when i worked for seattle public utilities which is you know climate change is not just this uh, a physical science challenge it's a social science challenge right uh, and um, you could have the best information in the world, but if you don't have a governance system or, um, you know, strong decision making processes or, or strong collaboration, then it's it's it won't be put to use in or will be put to use in an in, in appropriate way. Right. Um, and so uh, you really highlighted the importance and the multifaceted aspect here of, you know, just new data, better data, highly more resolved, um, spatially refined data is needed, um, but it's we need to have these processes in place to make sure it's put into use. And so, Hussein, I'm hoping you can maybe elaborate a little bit based on what Logan had to say and and given your work in the social sciences, you know, what, what do you see as... Uh, critical or how do you ensure that your work is being put into use this translation of knowledge into practice like what's 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 been your strategy to help to ensure that um both the information is is applied but also the those other sort of management systems are in place in order to ensure that information is used can you elaborate from your experience and if you want to bring in the security issue as part of that that would be terrific yeah, I've I've worked with think tanks that have um, uh, in the Middle East that 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 that, that are focused on applied research. Uh, in fact, uh, uh, I worked with uh, Mohammed Mahmoud uh, on uh, a project like that with a Shark uh, Institute based in uh, Istanbul just last year. And uh, I'm I'm going to put in a plug uh, for the web page the uh, conversation which publishes uh, work by academics exclusively that are uh, short pieces that are summaries of what academics have been working on. And these short pieces are uh, meant to reach a wider public. The Associated Press news agency uh, oftentimes seems to pick up most of what the conversation uh, webpage uh, publishes and and obviously the Associated Press has a uh, wide reach uh, globally. Uh, there were the Associated Press pieces are published uh, very widely around the world in many many newspapers. Um, so uh, on my campus uh, for the last five or so years, um, the senior administration on campus has um, uh, invigorated a policy institute and funded a policy institute that has been focused on um, uh, what um, Logan has described as new forms of collaboration, reaching out to the public, reaching out to the, to the, to the media. And um, I think academics need to um, in addition to, to publishing and peer-reviewed uh, outlets, they also need to be making their voices heard through the, um, uh, the media. And the new forces of new forms of collaboration, I would like to, to emphasize a point that Logan uh, quite well uh, said, uh, community involvement. Uh, we need greater community involvement. And, and, and I think by saying community involvement, Community buy-in uh, needs to happen, and I think an institution, uh, an, an institution that is underutilized in this area, are um, places of worship. In mm -hmm. a lot of countries, religious leaders are highly trusted, 
and uh, they can be they can have a strong influence on changing public attitudes in the right direction towards you know greater water conservation and and uh, environmental protection wow that's that's terrific i uh recall a study that was done several years ago that looked at uh this is in the u.s uh, around uh perceptions of climate change and trusted voices and it turned out water utilities were um, viewed as highly trusted on this issue. And so I think that issue of finding those trusted voices and how to engage them on, on this issue is a really uh, strong point. You had a follow up, Hussein? One more thing. Um, you know, about, you know, on which comes first, although Logan clarified his point, uh, climate, uh, or security and things like that. I just came back. I'm sitting now in Colorado, in my home in Colorado, but I just came back from a five week visit to Lebanon, uh, Syria, and Egypt. And uh, certainly in Lebanon and Syria, if you were to talk to them about climate change, I mean, nobody wants to hear that. I mean, there, that, you know, there's, there's, there's just so much suffering on the ground that people are having a real hard time making ends meet um so their their first priority is obviously you know putting food on the table and and having electricity for the elevator for an elderly person to go mm -hmm. up to the apartment in uh, in damascus uh, i was told that in damascus uh, there's such severe electricity rationing that um you know if you're outside of the right you know the so many hours of electricity provision, then uh, they turn on a generator um, at the peak of the, at the top of the hour for five minutes to run the elevators. So if you if you're gonna go to your tenth floor apartment in Damascus, you have to be there from from ten to ten o five. If you miss that five minute window, then you have to wait fifty five minutes. Um, so, so there is so there is we need to keep in mind the local street level context, if you like. Right. Yeah. So Nusha, um, wanted to come back to you on this issue of infrastructure that's come up and uh, think about it in the context of the again, this generation of knowledge and and its application. And you uh you have you sit in a you have a couple of different hats that you wear and specifically you are can clearly be a bridge between that research world your your day job and then the variety of extra work that you do for instance sitting on the commission of the Seattle or uh, San Francisco Public Utilities Commission and other work where you have uh, a bird's eye view on, you know, actual management of water resources and preparing for the future. So I'm curious uh, what, how you go about taking what you're seeing, what you're learning, what your uh, lab is doing and bringing it into the application world. And you've been a, a, a strong voice for this need to move towards you know, away from this purely centralized approach to water management to, you know, decentralized or hybrid models. So if, if you can respond to that, that would be great. And while you're doing that, there is a question in the chat or in the Q&A about uh, if you have seen any good models or projects in the Middle East that you think hold real promise for how to adapt to climate change. Yeah, sure. That's a great question. And I actually really enjoyed everybody's comments here. Some of them did come up, which I think is relevant to my comment that I was trying to make. So um, I think, uh, you know, Hussein mentioned this. Uh, in academia, we are very comfortable to sort of have some um, hypotheses, do our research, publish, and sort of move on. And the reality on the ground is very, very different, right? day-to-day decision-making is very different. The risk uh, managers are taking is very different. The mandates they're dealing with is very different, right? And it's not it's not a, a black and white. You can just say, or it's not like a switch that you can turn it off and on. Uh, you have to navigate those complexities in the real world, which makes it sometimes difficult to implement um, 
new ideas or sometimes actually even incorporate some of the knowledge that we are gaining. I'll give you an example. Um, you know, some of the projects that are in the books in different utilities, and Paul, you know this very well, um, it takes 10 to 15 years to go through the planning and design and getting it to, uh, you know, to the uh, sort of building part. And um, our knowledge within that 15 years have gone, has changed significantly. Now we might know better. Now we might have better climate models or water uh, resource management models. But the reality is this project is designed 15 years ago, based on the knowledge we had at the time. So this thinking about the design and design to build process and how long it takes. So I always think about, uh, you know, the water management and utility business is sort of like a slow moving uh, ship. And, you know, it's a Titanic, it's large, and it's not that easy to kind of change direction as soon as you sort of know something. Um and part of that is also driven by money. And that's another piece of this, right? When you do the design and, uh, you know, planning a design, then you go find money. And the money is attached to a project that's designed for the specific purpose. So, you know, we deal with this all the time here in the U.S. And I think it's very, very similar when you go to other countries as well. Um, you have to constantly think about um is if the money that's coming down is purposed for what kind of project? Can I pivot? If I cannot pivot, should I abandon the project? Probably the answer is no. So you keep sort of perpetuating the same model over and over because your governance is structure and institutional needs and set up and financial model, uh, it's sort of uh, feeding the system as it is. And, and it also it's important to remember um, you know, infrastructures is not like a shirt that we buy that we can, you know, if it, it doesn't fit, you can go change it, right? You build an infrastructure, it lasts like 50, 100 years. So if I'm building something today, it's going to last that long. So if I've missed that window of opportunity or I've designed for the wrong climate, the wrong realities, wrong needs, um, I'm sort of stuck with that with that tool or that infrastructure for a long time. And then when it comes to adaptation and responding uh, to the extremes we are experiencing and resilience, it's very hard to expect those kind of outcomes from it, something that doesn't belong to this time or doesn't have the capacity to respond to it. So I think this is always a challenge. And I think the foundational part of this is um, where does knowledge come in? How much we trust the knowledge? How does it get incorporated rather than just being a line in the conversation? How does it get incorporated in the process? And I think the sort of um, um, powers behind it is going to be about fin financing and money. What are we investing in? And the regulations and sort of institutional capacity that exists and I think this came up, uh, both Logan and Hossein brought this up, um, you know, development banks provide a lot of resources um, to sort of uh, build or rebuild infrastructure in different parts of the world. And a lot of those uh, resources are sort of tagged for conventional infrastructure mm -hmm. models, right? And that means that you're, again, Use I I use this word over and over. We are perpetuating the same problem we had, and we're just not breaking this um, this cycle. I think you brought up something very important, Paul, which is um, you know I always talk about this hybrid infrastructure. I think this this generation, this sort of era, is an era of I think um, both um, Hossein and Logan mentioned collaboration and and and, and um, um, sort of uh, collaborative governance. Absolutely. And I would say another part of this is also sort of modular solutions mm. and sort of incorporating local solutions as part of this collective movement that we are doing. For example, people have lived in the Middle East for thousands of thousands of years, right? They, they probably have local practices that worked. Like, for example, dry farming is a it, it was a very, very common practice in this region. We have switched to uh, irrigated agriculture since then. Um, 
some of those um, local solutions should not be abandoned in the uh, in the hope that some of the you know foreign ideas would change the situation. We have to actually embrace those local solutions, enhance them with some of these new ideas, but not abandoning them because those have worked there. Can we reinforce them? Can we provide more support to make them work better? I think that's really important. Um, and I think the whole modularity is going to be key in this era because we want to make sure we work with nature, build green infrastructure and green solution, try to use data and information technology, and build modular solution that we can um, that can easily can be adapted to different challenges we are facing at different times. So, um, you know, for example, a, 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 I'll bring this up, bring this example up just because uh, it's local to me right now, but but I think it's very much of a valuable tool anywhere that can be used. For example, in San Francisco now, we are having these on-site reuse systems that takes the water from your tap, from your shower, treats it mildly and use it for various purposes in the household that are, has nothing to do with drinking or cooking. And if you think about it, you want to make sure you're drink, drinking water and cooking water is pristine and clean. But a lot of other things that we do around the home doesn't require super duper clean water. Um, or actually, it can be treated locally, even you can treat it to the highest quality and reuse it in your household. So those kind of solutions has to go in every new building that's being built anywhere in the world, because in a way it reduces our um, energy footprint, our, our water footprint. It brings, um, you know, again, I, get, I really appreciate Hossein bringing up abundance and this whole wrong notion of there's a abundance of water to go and bring. So it brings water close to people and they realize um, they sort of connect to that resource. Uh, I think we have disconnected people from the resource and uh, therefore we have sort of um, eliminated public awareness and the importance of that resource for them. So kind of bring these kind of solutions not only can create circularity, circular economy for water, it can also bring resources to people, bring you close to them so they appreciate the amount of resources and energy and work that needs to get done for that resource to be available so they they don't waste it. Um, so I think I throw out a lot of different ideas, but <clears> I think all it's always good to go to that last. I guess there's so many good threads that I was trying to pull from, but I think um, at the end of the day, um, there are plenty of great solutions out there that we can actually, you know, for example, groundwater recharge, um, green infrastructure, uh, natural eco natural uh, infrastructure, um, enabling ecosystem to work with us and be our partner, uh, creating circular economy around water at every scale. Um, all these things can be, they all could be power, powerful tools. We just need to have the right governance structure, right enforcement mechanisms, policies in place, and also have right financial tools that enables these kind of solutions to, to be implemented and uh, used. Thanks, Nisha. Um, this is, you sort of strike a somewhat of a hopeful, positive uh, chord here. And I think that's a good pivot to the, our, I think our final segment. Uh, a couple of things I wanted to react to. One is this notion of modularity, right? And I hear that and I think uh, kind of portfolio approaches, right? Where you, placing a big bet on one large piece of infrastructure to meet your needs seems particularly perilous nowadays, right? Um, one, the, the lead time can be so long that it, it you lock out the ability to ingest new knowledge and new information. And if you uh, sort of bet on a, a future and you're wrong, then that system may not perform nearly as much as well as you had hoped. And so taking being able to pursue modular approaches, and I hear you it's not saying either or, it's really, you know, kind of both. And, and maybe if you've got this long-lived asset or that's had this long planning cycle um, that isn't well-suited to incorporate new information, then think about 
strategies around that that can add in flexibility and can provide performance for the scenarios that that you know larger infrastructure maybe isn't going to work for um that, that's what i kind of hear you talking about and I, I really think that that's just as you all have described a, a change in academia of of really focusing on the supplied knowledge i think our decision makers our our utilities our water managers also need to be looking at themselves and thinking about how they change how they do things and um you've nicely laid out some of those uh some of those examples um so with the, the remaining time uh and recognizing we're not going to have the full day that i was hoping we could have um uh and i want to say that i will drop uh, logan had included links to the podcast that he has in the chat i'll, I'll move it over to the q a so i think all the um attendees can see it and definitely encourage you all to subscribe so we keep it at the top of the list in 12 different countries. Um, I think that should be a, a shared goal for all of us today. Um, but let's pivot to looking ahead to the COP28 in UAE. And, uh, you know, um, it's easy to be uh, get disappointed with these events um, if you're hungering for rapid and deep change, right? So uh, tempering our, I don't know if anyone's enthusiastic about it, but I think tempering our enthusiasm is is always good, but they're important, right? They're really important. And I'm curious for you all, um, what what aspirations you have, um, you know, the uh, unlimited perhaps aspirations, perhaps uh, more tempered, what do you think can happen? Uh, what do you think should happen? What's reasonable to expect to come out of COP28 as it relates to this topic at hand today? Um, and if you'd rather not dive into the COP issue, then you can, if you could share, you know, where do you find hope? Where do you think there are some great examples of the integration of these issues that we talked about today, the integration of data and information with Good governance models, collaborative models. Um, it would be. I want to sort of wrap this up with this look towards the future and what we can expect, or highlighting some good things that are happening on the ground. And we'll uh, be sure to close to bring Mohammed back on to put in a plug for the rest of the the week here at the Middle East Institute. But Deanna, let's turn to you since you're you're in uh, Abu Dhabi. And uh, UAE is the um, host the presidency for the COP this year. What do you expect? What are you hoping for to come out of um, COP that will help society writ large, or perhaps help you do your job more effectively? I think having uh, having a COP in the UAE uh, coming in uh, in November and December uh, this year uh, is really has uh, initiated a a uh, so, sort of energy around it. And even if the event is not here yet, uh, you can see a lot of events happening uh, uh, towards the COP. And this has uh, really a lot of benefits because uh, you can raise awareness by having these events, even uh, whether it's at schools or even uh, with, with the public and in the society. Uh, and uh, the youth can really, really learn about uh, the big challenges that we have. Uh, many of the words that we use are uh, uh, unknown to them. They don't understand what we mean by climate change or by, uh, you know, the water uh, resources uh, depletion, depletion or any other words we talk about uh, as experts or scientists. So uh, this is really very good uh, and positive uh, vibes that are going around here in the UE at different levels and uh, in different uh, sectors of the society. Uh, now, more on the um, uh, aspiration for the COP. I would like, uh, and many uh, colleagues uh, would like to see actually uh, some uh, actions uh, and solutions being uh, proposed at COP, not only uh, talks, political talks, and uh, uh, everyone has uh, his or her views, but at the end, I think everyone would like to, to say, for example, COP28 reached this agreement, reached this solution. And these can be uh, especially on the adaptation and especially on the financing uh, uh, process 
for for the most vulnerable uh, countries and population that are uh, now already facing uh, disasters from uh, from climate change. Uh, so yeah, these are the two hopes that um, uh, hopefully we, we can achieve uh, in the COP. Great, thank you. Hussein, how about you? You're so on mute. I yeah, mute myself, yes. Um, how about me? I, in terms of hope, I want to talk about hope and the, and the future. Uh, there is a um, new mood in the region whereby countries are building. There, there is a building of peace between peace bridges between Iran and the Gulf states, and uh, with uh, this, uh, there, there, there should be uh, a greater trust in the international trade system whereby countries can once again um, trust that they can import food from abroad as opposed to growing it locally. So there, there should be less need for uh, localization of food production because localization of food production in very arid uh, areas of the Middle East from Egypt to the Gulf states um, is not um, environmentally sustainable. And uh, the um, the peace building brings opportunities for rebuilding state institutions, and by rebuilding state institutions, it allows for uh, greater attention to environmental protection and and um, uh, and better water management. And of course, uh, one always hopes for greater cooperation between uh, countries that share international river systems. Turkey um, for the last two, three years seems to be taking also a peace, uh, they, uh, seems to be building bridges of peace between itself and other countries. So um, there is a hope for a greater cooperation on the Tigris and Euphrates rivers. Um, uh, you know, that, that cooperation that is much, much needed uh, as an FYI related to climate change and to um, water management slash mismanagement of the Tigris and Euphrates. In 2018, there was a severe drought in the region, so much so that people in Iraq were able to wade through the Tigris and Euphrates, which is an unheard of phenomenon. Uh, these are the, you know, in regional terms, mighty rivers to be able to walk through them uh, is a um, mental reminder of the extreme, um, uh, the extre the, how extreme the problem of water scarcity has become in in Iraq. And uh, pass it back to you, Paul. Yeah, that um, is a reminder of the delusion of imagine imagined affinity, isn't it? Um, when right, yep. Yeah. Uh, Logan, or I'm sorry, Nushik, uh, uh, let's go to you. Can, can you share your thoughts on what you expect or hope to see coming out of COP? Yeah, I think a lot of great points have been raised by uh, Diana and Hossein. I think uh, one thing I would say is um, I would like to see a little bit more focus on demand management. I think that we need to kind of switch this model of uh, infinite supply we can always bring water to people we just need to find the next source we just you know we just need a little bit more of energy a little bit more of this to make it happen and the reality is we actually really on the water side we have to think about how can we manage demand more effectively how can we make sure actually we have literally have to switch to demand management as a foundation for water supply security rather than uh, constantly looking for more supplies and letting people go and i think Paul, that goes back to what you brought up, which was like, uh, it's a social water uh, security or achieving water security is much more of a social issue rather than just an uh, infrastructure issue. And I think trying to change mindsets, changing the institutional governance and structure is quite important. And I think these large events provide an opportunity for peer-to-peer -peer learning. And I think that's really important in addition to building cooperation and collaboration. I'm uh, sort of excited to see water becoming more and more central to some of these conversations. Uh, it didn't used to be. So I think definitely skiing the water, getting sort of like, um, it's it's sort of a first share. I don't want to say full first share, but 
finding it, you know, sit at the table is important. And I think, um, uh, and part of that is water and energy are sort of super, in, superly interlinked and intertwined. And we really cannot manage one without thinking about the other. And while everybody's thinking about our energy transition. And there is this perception that this clean energy future is, is um, going to solve our all our problems. Actually, that transition has a lot of water footprint that we are not mm -hmm. thinking about. So as a lot of the decisions we are making around water security, mm -hmm. a lot of it has a lot of energy footprint that we are not necessarily thinking about. So it's trying to think across the board how these sort of overcoming these sectoral silos that are uh, sort of uh, preventing us to build um, better solutions for the future is also going to be super important. For example, if you focus on demand management in both sides, you have you know less demand for water requires less energy, so you reduce your carbon footprint. Less demand in energy means that you use less water in the, all the entire process. So you can actually leave more water for other needs that exist. So sort of thinking about this cross-sectoral uh, opportunities is going to be important. And I think COP can definitely provide those opportunities for this peer-to-peer -peer learning, uh, broader engagement across the board, thinking about overcoming some of these sectoral silos that we have. And I think Deanna mentioned that sort of, and potentially having, building some power behind these or sort of putting some faith into these ideas, financial models that can enable this kind of transition, goals that we can set that are meaningful across the board, um, then hopefully can provide some direction uh, for countries that are involved to make better decisions as they're thinking about infrastructure and sort of future water security and future energy security and sort of mitigating climate change. You know, the energy transition issue I've, uh, in very simple terms, I thought about it as pivoting from a carbon-based, you know, energy system to one that is highly dependent on metals and minerals, right? The uh, moving from one mining model to yeah. another mining yeah. model. Right. Yeah. Yes. Awesome. That's right. exactly exactly. what it is. <laughs> you know, and yeah. uh that's not a free lunch, right? We we've, we've yeah. seen all the discussions around lithium mining yeah. and water implications and the concerns about the ocean mining is yeah. out there as well, right? So you're spot on uh, in terms of uh, helping. I think we can all play a role in helping to ensure that water is, uh, it's it's such a connector, right? We talk about water yeah. as a sector, but it's also a connector and it's a way to surface, uh, no pun intended, uh, <laughs> some of these issues. So Logan, let's let's turn to you. And I know you you have do a lot of work around governance and social justice issues. And um, what's, how do you, what are you looking at um, in terms of COP and and what are you hoping for or what do you think is a, a likely outcome as it as it pertains to these issues of water management and environmental sustainability? I'll try to find some fresh air as new show yeah. is also, yeah. also looking for fresh air. And I think um, we've seen a slow progression of the integration of new voices. Uh, and I'd like to see that continue to progress where we uh, diversify the voices that we hear. And it's not just for the sake of the diversification. If we think about youth and tomorrow's event, which uh, Mohammed will tell us about, is about youth activism. Uh, our, you know, in, the, in the Gulf, it's not particularly known for its civil society activism, but it might be more active than people are aware. Uh, tomorrow's host, Nishad Shafi, uh, along with Hessa Naimi here in Qatar are leading the Arab Youth Climate Movement. There's Activists in Action here in Qatar. There's Deep and Doha Environmental Actions Project, all really drawing on youth energy. So it's not the integration of youth voices for the sake of having youth voices. It's because they're leading action. And I think that's really important that in these events, they're not just there uh, and they're on the periphery, but they're there and we're recognizing the role that they're playing. Um, so that's that's one diversification of voices that, uh, that I think we hope to continue to see. And then the diversification of voices, it's great that we have uh, you know, new actors. We've spoke earlier about the importance of traditional or indigenous knowledge systems, recognizing uh, ways in which sustainable ways of, of living and working could be revisited, rethought, integrated as, as we look at uh, the future. 
and that requires those voices to be heard. Um, so having those, uh, again, not on the periphery at side events that few people are, are attending, but at the center. And um, those are the two, if you like, these are power shifts about whose voice is, is heard, whose voice is important. Um, I'd love to see more of that shift. And uh, this has multiple dimensions, uh, definitely in, in the youth space, in the gender space, in the, in the Global South uh, voices space. Yeah, and your point about it, it's not a check the box, it's a strength, it's a source of strength, right, um, to bring those voices in uh, and have them be central to the discussion. Um, that's that's really powerful. Um, well, can I quickly you know, mention something before we switch? I think we didn't touch on water quality. And I think it's such an important issue when you're talking about water security because it water quantity and quality are two sides of the same coin. So if you don't achieve quality concerns or uh, protect water quality, you actually can impact water security. And some of these climate change issues, I mean, the impacts of climate change, one of the direct impacts is actually water quality challenges. So I think that's another thing we have to keep an eye on. The less we use water, the less we take, you know, as we take less water from the environment or we use less water, we actually have a lot less water quality footprint. So just want to um, leave that point with everyone too. Yeah, I mean, you could have uh, a, a perceived a total abundance of water, but if it's of low quality, then it's essentially not there, right? Um, and the other thing we haven't touched on is explicitly is the... In, sort of the ecosystem aspects here of, of water management, um, which uh, is definitely near and dear uh, to me. Um, and I, you know, I'll maybe show some ignorance, but I think that's a maybe a, an issue that isn't first and foremost when people think about the Middle East, but I think the rich tapestry of, of um, ecosystems in, in the Middle East are, is, certainly something that we we could spend a lot of time discussing and i'd also add that you know i think hussein's looks like you want to come in uh uh has alluded to the food security issues which agriculture right Agri the use of water in agriculture globally is the you know the prominent user of water uh from a consumptive perspective and uh we haven't really discussed that and the implications of local food production and water management is certainly another issue to that we could discuss if we just had that full day if Mohammed gave us the full week maybe that would we could do that but Hussein you wanted to come in no a quick point uh Nush has uh there's a follow-up uh, to Nusha's point about water and, and your point about water quality and and, and what have you uh water quality was um I just want to remind the audience that there was a major cholera outbreak in Syria, Lebanon, and I believe in Yemen, and perhaps even in Iraq. But I know Syria, Lebanon, and, and Yemen really struggled with this, and that's very much related to water, water quality. Water quality is a huge issue when it comes to red eyed in the Persian Gulf, when it comes yeah. to desalination plants and things like that. And red tide is related in part to uh, climate change and to uh, new, increased nutrient load, and waste, you know, poor quality water in, in the Persian Gulf. And in terms of the ecosystem point that you mentioned, Paul, I think Nusha kind of alluded to it when she mentioned green infrastructure, right? The green infrastructure is, um, uh, is a logical uh, approach for uh, many countries, especially those struggling with uh, weak budgets. And uh, it just makes um, uh, good sense, I think, uh, economically as well. The economic side, I think, it deserves greater attention. Uh, green infrastructure tends to be cheaper than gray infrastructure in uh, most uh, cases. Indeed, and I think it also has that some of those modularity qualities that Nusha described. Um, and, uh, you know, think about it from a portfolio perspective perspective is an important way. I think Mohammed mentioned some of the mangrove restoration work that's that's happening in his opening remarks and certainly could be uh, part of the puzzle for addressing sea level rise, which uh, again, I think Logan, you explicitly mentioned that. We haven't really described that, but the uh, I think Deanna mentioned the 
the lag that we have in our system, sea level rise is unfortunately something that we'll be grappling with for several hundred years, right? Um, given the the inertia in the system and the those delayed feedback loops that will uh, happen because of the legacy of emissions. So, so much more to talk about, and um, really been a great honor to to join you all today. It's uh, terrific to hear all of your perspectives. I hope the attendees, I'm sure they felt the same way. Um, Mohammed, I want to invite you to come back and uh, wrap us up and uh, help us think about the rest of the week and that many of you here today will join in the future events over the next uh, four days. So Mohammed, can you come back and wrap us up? Of course. Um, first of all, I just wanted to say that I'm extremely jealous. Part of me wishes I was on this panel because um, out of all the topics and issues we cover, uh, as I think all of you know, water is uh, is closest to my heart and my bread and butter. But uh, you all did uh, raised all the points I would have raised anyhow and, and did so uh, so very well. And yes, we could have spent a, a week on this, but I have to uh, have to be impartial and make sure we cover all the other topics that are relevant to, to climate issues in the region. And I want to thank you, Paul, for really uh, masterfully uh, uh, coordinating the discussion. I thought I think I thought you asked really great questions, and and uh, and response got really good answers. And I wanted to also thank all of you, uh, Logan, Nusha, <clears throat> Diana, Hassan, for your participation and, and, and great comments. I uh, I expected no less. So thanks again for your participation. Um, also. Um, I will make sure to, uh, I'll ask our events team, and I will as well, to post the uh, podcast. we got to keep it number one in 12 countries. I feel like that's our homework for today. Um, so I'll make sure our events team, uh, our social media team, post it on, on MEI socials, and I'll do as well uh, online. And actually, um, I, I had the pleasure of participating in it in the past. I know several several of my broader colleagues have as well. It's really an excellent podcast uh, on sustainability in the region. Um, so again, thank you all for great discussion. Uh, for those of you uh, that are watching live, uh, this video will be posted on, on uh, MEI's YouTube website. So it'll be available for others to show, to see, and to be shared uh, for others to view later. And just to, uh, <clears throat> just as was mentioned, to plug the rest of the week, but mainly to plug tomorrow, as both Logan and Paul mentioned, tomorrow's focus will be on climate engagement and youth activism. Uh, with really uh, some key voices that have been really uh, um, uh, transformative in terms of moving uh, that part of the climate agenda forward, <clears throat> excuse me, as it relates to the interests of, of youth in the region as it pertains to climate. And I would almost dare say to the global south. I mean, there's always been this, this issue of the global south not getting uh, their, her their voice not being heard as much in terms of climate issues. Uh, and, and for us, certainly in the region, uh, a great, uh, a great uh, representative that a participant within the global south being the MENA region. So there'll be more of that tomorrow. So definitely do tune in. Uh, 10 a.m. Uh, Eastern time and uh, whatever that translates to your respective part of the world. I know we have an international audience. So thank you also very much. Um, and uh, for all of our uh, listeners and the, our viewers, hopefully we'll see you all tomorrow, uh, 10 a.m. Eastern when we talk.